Good afternoon and welcome. I'm Laura Seip, Director of Strategic Engagement and Alumni Relations for the College of Engineering. And I'm excited to have you join us today for our conversation, Where You Live Matters, Equity, Resilience, and the Built Environment. Now, I know today is April Fool's, but this is no joke. For those of you who are joining us today, we anticipate that you will be part of one of the largest audiences for any virtual event that the college has hosted since we began doing these about a year ago. So thank you for being here. We're really excited to have you. Now, several months ago, the college began taking a hard look at what we could do to better foster a diverse and inclusive environment for all of our faculty, staff, students, and alumni. We have a long way to go, but we're taking some steps in the right direction. So maybe you've seen them in the college's social media channels or read about them on the pages of Buckeye Engineering, but I just wanted to make you aware of some of those efforts. First, we have developed a racial equity and inclusion action plan with concrete steps that we will take to help make our college a more welcoming and inclusive place. We've also created the Diversity Outreach and Inclusion Priority Fund, which is designated to help us support these new efforts that we are putting into place for the college. So if those sound interesting to you, we'll be talking a little bit more about those at the end of the program. But what I am most excited about is that we have faculty in the college already who are doing real world research that impacts social justice issues within our communities. So today you're going to hear from four of those faculty. You're going to learn about the projects that they're doing and the results that they are seeing. And then we'll have a broader panel discussion around how those of us who are engineers, designers, planners, architects, how we can use our skills to address social justice issues within communities and impact the greater well being. And we'll have plenty of time at the end for questions from the audience. So as you're listening into today's conversation, don't be shy. Please put your questions in the Q&A function, which should be on the bottom of your Zoom screen. Our speakers will be addressing those throughout the program. But again, we will have time for live Q&A with the speakers at the end. So get to asking those questions. Also, if you do need access to closed captioning services, you can press the closed captioning button on the bottom of the screen and that'll be provided for you. So now I am happy to introduce our moderator for today's conversation. She is no stranger to research in social justice and the impact on communities. Um, it, this is Dr. Rachel Cleet who is our Associate Dean of Faculty Affairs for the college and also a professor in city and regional planning. Dr. Cleet. Thank you, Laura. I want to welcome everybody to today's conversation. Um, you know, when people go into academia or come to work at a university, it's often because they want to make the world a better place. And at Ohio State, our motto is disciplina in civitatem, education for citizenship. Engineers, planners, architects, and landscape architects of our college engage in research and education that takes this motto very seriously and engage in making the world better in a very problem-focused and very concrete ways that enhance uh, their own and their students' abilities to be citizens of the world. As the recent past has highlighted, our world is faced with increasing social inequality, especially economic inequality. And this is something that's happening all over the world. And the US high, has the highest income inequality level of all advanced economies. This inequality extends to the impact of the location of your home on your, on, um, your education or job access or food, the quality of the built environment on your health, and the ability of local infrastructure to respond to natural and human-made disasters. And of course, race overlaid on all of that. So what does it mean to educate for citizenship in this context? It means that through our actions as researchers, we demonstrate to our students our dedication to being citizens <clears throat> who use all of their talents to solve important problems 
including those of social inequality. We also give our students the chance to be part of that future, either through what they learn in the classroom or their engagement in the work we do. Educating for citizenship can only be done if we work towards equity and the preservation of the systems we all share as well. I'd like to introduce our first speaker, um, Karen Dana Miller. Uh, Karen is, uh, Dr. Dana Miller is assistant professor in civil engineering and environmental health sciences. And her work uh, with indoor environmental quality research group addresses emerging environmental concerns within the built environment. Dr. Dana Miller. Great, thank you so much for the introduction and for having me here today. Uh, I direct the Indoor Environmental Quality Research Group, which I really see as the next frontier in environmental engineering. And I'm really excited to share some of our work with you today and how it relates to the built environment and particularly housing. So the US Department of Health and Human Services has released Healthy People 2030. And among other things, it describes some of the social determinants of health. And these are the conditions in the environment that affect health. So these are things like access to education, economic stability. Um, and the one that we really focus on in our research group is neighborhood and the built environment. So in the Indoor Environmental Quality Group, we study how the indoor environment affects the chemical and chemicals and microbes that are present and how that impacts exposure and human health. This is especially important for those in underserved communities and low-income communities who might be more likely to live in poor quality housing that can negatively impact their health. One issue I wanted to highlight in particular was the effect of mold. Um, mold Today in homes, exposure to that mold can cost $22.4 billion a year. So it's a huge problem for society. It can affect anyone, but it does disproportionately affect those who might be living in poor quality housing. And it's usually not as pretty as this piece of artwork right here. In fact, it makes up 16% of the costs associated with allergic rhinitis, acute bronchitis, and well, as well as asthma. And in our research group, we're dedicated to studying this as well as other exposures to better understand how those exposures occur and how we can prevent them, which is especially important for those uh, who might be uh, impacted, those who might suffer from asthma, who are also more likely to be in those underserved communities. So one of the research projects I wanted to highlight today was understanding how how dampness in the indoor environment can impact mold growth. Uh, so uh, for this study, we actually went around Ohio collecting carpet and dust from homes. Um, I like to joke that I'm going to start a renovation company. So if you'd like a square of your carpet removed from the middle of your room, please let me know. Uh, these are, of course, all from homes of people who were getting rid of their carpet anyway. And we take it back to our lab and expose it to elevated relative humidity conditions and excess dampness to see what happens and characterize those microbial communities to better understand when mold might grow. This is especially important because so much of our exposure comes from the floor. Anytime you walk around, you resuspend all that dust out of the floor um, and you can become exposed to the microbes that are, are present there. We've taken some cool images of this. This is done by my student, Nick Mistassi. Um, at different relative humidity levels, you can see at 90% um, on the big nylon carpet fibers, you just see dust particles, not a lot of microbial growth. As the relative humidity goes up to 80 and 85%, we see some fungal growth. These are our hyphae, they're sort of extending. And then finally at 90 and 95%, we see extensive fungal growth, these fruiting bodies. And we can really characterize when this might become a problem and actually quantify how much exposure might result from these elevated moisture conditions. Uh, this this is actually not only a problem on earth, but also uh, on spacecraft. So we've uh, received funding from NASA to also look at what can happen up there. This was an extensive problem for Mir uh, that had extensive fungal growth at the time of its decommissioning. So the fungi were actually degrading things like wiring and window seals, which are, are pretty important if you're in spacecraft. We learned a lot from this. And so the relative humidity is much better controlled on the International Space Station today. But we still have uh, um, some specific times when it can be problematic, such as on this panel here where astronauts were hanging their wet towels. Uh, we've received dust from the International Space Station, and it turns out it behaves very similar to dust on Earth. Uh, so we're basically modeling a ventilation system failure. It looks pretty clean up there right now, but if there were to be a problem, uh, now we can better understand what would happen, how to detect it, and what we might be able to do about it. 
Um, on Earth, there are things we can do about it too. We have an ongoing project um, in collaboration with the Asthma Express program at Nationwide Children's Hospital. And this program goes into the homes of the kids uh, who have the most severe asthma and are going back to those their homes and being triggered um, by this asthma repeatedly. Uh, we're working with them to develop a smartphone app paired with a color changing badge that can actually uh, measure very rapidly the presence of allergens in their home. Uh, so this is a really great tool that the nurses can use to rapidly identify what allergens might be problematic in the homes of these kids and then take steps to fix them. Uh, so once we, we do our research to understand what's going on, we can actually take steps to measure these things and help improve the housing for these kids and especially those who might be dis disproportionately affected uh, by poor quality housing. Uh, so once again, uh, the social determinants of health are really important um, in understanding how the impact of our surrounding environment can actually impact our health. Um, in my group, we focus specifically on mold as well as chemical and other microbial exposures in the built environment and how that can impact our health. But there are a lot of things that we need to learn more about to help improve these conditions for these vulnerable populations. I have a lot of people to thank for this work, um, especially my students. This is us pictured here in 2019, back when we could be um, closer together, as well as our collaborators um, who have worked. I, I've worked with some fantastic students in the College of Engineering, as well as uh, fantastic collaborators, uh, both within us, OSU and outside. And of course, I want to thank our funding agencies who made this research possible. Um, we received uh, funding support from um, National Science Foundation, National Institutes of Health, Alfred, Alfred P. Sloan Foundation, NASA and uh, the Department of Housing and Urban Development. Um, so with that, I would love uh, to take your questions. Thank you for, for listening. So I, I see that there, we do have a question in the chat and I'm gonna be able to get to those at the end when we have a, a broader um, array of people to answer questions. Uh, so Dr. Dana Miller, I, I wanted to ask you a question about um, how being at Ohio State um, impacts your research. Are there unique opportunities for collaboration? What resources are there that really uh, allow you to do your work? That's a great question. Um, there, are, there are many things I love about Ohio State, but I'd like to highlight two of them. One is I love the size of Ohio State because you can find just about anybody that you need working in a specific topic area. If I need to collaborate with someone who does something very specific, odds are pretty good that I can find that person here and they're doing really high quality work and we can work together. Uh, the other thing I wanted to highlight is some of the amazing resources on campus. Uh, the images that you saw were collected at by CMOS, which is a really cutting edge microscopy facility here. It's actually extremely challenging to take uh, microscope images of carpet like that. And they were fantastic to work with. They have great instruments available. It really wouldn't have been possible without them. So we have, um, and they're just one of the many resources on campus. Actually, Karen, let me ask you um, the question that was posed in the chat, which is in the, which in the Q and A, which is that, the person's wondering why why we're not seeing vinyl floors in, in places where there are young children and they call around. Do you have any sense of why that might be? Or vinyl flooring? Yeah. Yes. So I, I am not actually completely anti-carpet. A lot of people think that I might be. Um, I just think very carefully about where we put carpet in our homes and also be dedicated to maintaining it so that it's clean and it does not get damp. Uh, so carpet you do get a higher exposure to carpets. There's a higher resuspension rate of that dust, and it does act as a reservoir. We held a workshop um, here at Ohio State actually specifically on carpet to look at that. Um, so for, for children, vinyl flooring, depending on what, it, what it's made of, can also contain phthalates, which can be harmful to health as well. So you want to be careful. Um, solid surface flooring, though, are going to be better to reduce uh, resuspension. Um, and you should have less exposure, but you also want to think about injury prevention with small kids. Uh, so, you know, I, ha I have two small kids of my own and I see them fall down all the time and carpets are better for injury prevention. So I think we just want to think really carefully about this. I would definitely advise against putting any carpet in your bathroom. And if you do have someone in your home who has allergies or asthma, you also want to think carefully about how you're cleaning that carpet, when you're cleaning it and who's cleaning it. Thank you so much, Dr. Dan Miller. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm gonna introduce now uh, Dr. Jason Reese. Um, he's an assistant professor in city and regional planning. And his work uh, is on uh, the neighborhood, neighborhood inequality and the move to prosper housing pilot. And he has a lot to say about kids who are avoiding the kinds of environmental issues uh, that Dr. Dan Miller researches. 
Thank you, uh, Rachel, and uh, happy to be here uh, as part of this uh, dialogue today. And also having a chance to learn about some of the great work uh, being completed by my colleagues uh, at OSU. Um, my work is uh, in many ways connected uh, to the work that Karen presented earlier, um, looking at this intersection of housing and the built environment um, and particularly health equity. Um, so as uh, was discussed in the earlier presentation, um, we understand the importance of kind of housing conditions in terms of habitability and how that can impact health uh, outcomes particularly. Um, my work looks at the nexus of housing conditions, uh, neighborhood conditions, and housing uh, instability or stability and affordability, and tries to understand really the uh, interplay between these factors in terms of how they impact health. Um, earlier in my career, uh, analytically, I focused on really trying to understand uh, the dimensions of neighborhoods which are critical to quality of life um, and create analytical uh, mechanisms primarily through GIS analysis um, to really be able to kind of comprehensively and holistically look at neighborhood conditions and therefore uh, see um, you know, across counties or regions uh, which neighborhoods are healthiest, which are not, which have kind of the life enhancing resources that we know are critical um, in which are, are lacking those resources. Um, if you look at the left-hand side of my screen, um, you will see a, a version of this work, uh, which is called an opportunity map. Um, and this map uh, looks at uh, a number of different indicators across uh, the domains of transportation, employment, housing conditions, health, safety, and education, and uh, analyzes uh, which neighborhoods perform best based on these different metrics, uh, which neighborhoods are under-resourced or more challenged in regards to these metrics. Um, so if you look at this map of Franklin County, um, you will see that these dark red areas on the map indicate those areas uh, within Franklin County where neighborhoods um, really are uh, very well resourced and doing quite well in terms of these various kind of uh, opportunity metrics that we're looking at. Um, if you look at the lighter color areas in the map, um, you will see then neighborhoods which are on the opposite end of that spectrum, um, under-resourced and um, facing a lot of challenges in terms of, of neighborhood conditions. Um, from particularly uh, a racial equity perspective then, um, this provides us kind of a framework to analyze um, who's living in these communities, um, who's uh, are, are particular populations that have been marginalized or face discrimination, um, more likely to be living in these kind of challenging neighborhood environments. Um, so if you look on the right hand side of the screen, you'll see a map that overlays the African American community uh, here in Franklin County. And we do see that relationship where um, there is a profound racial equity uh, uh, issue in the context of um, where the African American community uh, lives in, the, in regards to their neighborhood conditions. Um, and this is a byproduct of, of decades of discrimination in the housing market in particular. Um, outside of analytics, my work focuses on uh, different forms of policy intervention uh, to address uh, these dynamics and to hopefully provide access to healthy environments to folks. Um, Part of this work is looking holistically at really neighborhood uh, interventions that look at improving the built environment. Um, some of my work has been with Nationwide Children's Hospital, where we've looked at the Southside community and how a very kind of rigorous and holistic effort to improve housing and improve other aspects of um, uh, community uh, social supports in the context of that Southside neighborhood is impacting quality of life in that community. Um, particularly from an equity perspective. Um, more recently, uh, I have been working actually with Dr. Clyte on um, the Move to Prosper initiative, which is a housing mobility program that looks at how stabilizing families into healthier homes in higher resourced and safe neighborhoods impacts their quality of life, but particularly um, their health and other life outcomes for not only the, the, the parents in the program, but also the, the children in the program. Um, so I've had a unique opportunity here to 
um, follow 10 families for the last almost four years, uh, going on three plus years now, um, to understand how relocation into healthy housing, into safe neighborhoods, and into well-resourced neighborhoods impacts their quality of life. And we've been able to really kind of understand uh, a model of how changes occur in terms of outcomes for families as a result of this type of policy intervention. Um, the first thing we see is that children see immediate health improvements because their indoor air quality has improved so drastically. Um, and parents see a great decline in the volume of stress that they're dealing with uh, because they're in state more stable housing. Um, they're not running the kids to the ER all the time because of asthma attacks, and they feel like their kids are safe in the environments that they're in. Um, in the second phase, uh, primarily starting in the first, the end of the first year and into the second year, we began to see uh, mental health improvements for kids and parents, primarily because of the reduction in stress. Uh, and parents begin to engage with coaches in the program, uh, and we see shifts to parenting style. Next, we see economic conditions begin to change for families in the second year. Credit scores improve. We see progressive job changes, incomes improve, and we see kids really benefit from the additional resources that they're getting in their school. And finally, in this last uh, evaluation that we did of the program, um, we found uh, great increases to children's academic outcomes um, and uh, surprisingly, uh, a, a tremendous resilience for parents in particular as they dealt with economic consequences of the, of the pandemic. Um, and then another uh, real surprise was that we began to see kind of enterprising activities from parents in this later, uh, in the later years of the program, even going as far as starting successful uh, small business startups. Um, so it has been a, a real opportunity here to understand um, how you know, access to healthy housing and a safe neighborhood, as well as a well-resourced community can be life-changing in terms of uh, the health outcomes for families, but also can be critical to addressing issues such as racial equity uh, in our community. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Reese. I have a couple questions for you. I also want to know from your perspective, what are the opportunities for collaboration and access to resources here at Ohio State? Yeah, that, it's really phenomenal. Um, the, I'll use Move to Prosper as an example here. Um, this is a program that benefits from collaboration across campus. Um, you know, social work has been, the College of Social Work has been involved with this. Uh, of course, the, within the College of Engineering, uh, the City and Regional Planning Program is involved in this as well, as well as the College of Public Health. Uh, and that just gives you a great example of how at OSU, we can truly be multidisciplinary in the way we approach uh, projects. And um, just the synergies created from that are, are really profound when you merge this expertise together around a social challenge. What, what do you see as the future focus of your work? Yeah, uh, I think uh, for myself, I, I'm uh, intrigued by kind of long-term uh, st housing support programs like Move to Prosper. Um, longitudinally, can we really truly understand how um, changes occur in the context of people's uh, health outcomes, um, but also their mental health and how powerful that is in the context of other aspects of their life in regards to uh, their employment, um, their educational goals, their children's educational outcomes. Um, so I do see that uh, really being something that I'm taking away from this experience in terms of just the power of being able to uh, work collaboratively in a research uh, environment with families over the long term. Thank you, Dr. Reese. I I'm going to introduce next um, Dr. Abdullah Shafiazadeh. Um, he is a, the Lichtenstein Professor in Civil Engineering, and his work um, is on how the resiliency of the electrical grid impacts communities. And I want you just to think for a minute in the audience about what would happen in your community if a disaster hit, if you had an incident like the twin hurricanes that hit Puerto Rico or a loss of power as we saw in Texas just about a month ago, how would kids go to school remotely? Um, Abdul. Thank you very much, Rachel, for, for the introduction. Uh, it is my great pleasure to be here today. Uh, my research generally focuses on reliability and resilience of uh, critical infrastructure systems, including the power grid. Um, uh, 
as we see in this map, the US uh, faces risk from a variety of natural hazards, but for the power grid, particularly um, climatic risks are of particular concern. Um, during uh, events uh, such as uh, hurricanes, hundreds to thousands of these uh, structures in the power grid may fail, and these failures are a primary reason for the um, major power outages that we experience. To be able to assess various dimensions of risk uh, to the society because of power outages, we need the capability to be able to project the state of the infrastructure into the future under the risks from natural hazards, and that challenges the focus of my lab. We have developed the notion of life cycle resilience and sustainability for the belt environment as it relates to the impacts of the natural hazards. And uh, with this capability, we can uh, use optimization models to uh, develop the best course of action. For my research, uh, we start with uh, characterization of the infrastructure deterioration processes, as well as uh, natural hazards. And then we look at the uh, compounding effects of these stressors on the components and structures of the grid. And then we move to the system level to look at how these local failures impact the system level performance of the grid through integration with optimization, then we are able to develop uh, strategies that can improve resilience most effectively. Uh, at the structure level, we have been developing high fidelity computational models of the grid structures under extreme loads, and we have uh, verified, calibrated, and validated these computational models using wind tunnel experiments, among other means. And with these, we have uh, reached high fidelity in the capability of our models to capture various complex failure mechanisms that may emerge in these systems under extreme events. One uh, key need in the field is the likelihood of various types of failure that may happen in the system. This is important to improve the design of these structures under uh, extreme events, as well as to improve the recovery processes. It can help us to understand which parts of the system are most vulnerable and what resources we need to uh, improve the speed of the recovery. In a project we had with Korea Atomic Energy Research Institute recently, um, we investigated the multi-hazard fragility of transmission systems against sequences of hurricanes and, uh, and earthquakes. Such a sequence is, is not uh, very common, but uh, such a sequence happened a few years ago in Japan and Korea was concerned about the, the impact of such a sequence on the reliability of the shutdown operation of nuclear power plants in Korea. And a product of that research is shown in the bottom right of this slide. At the system level, uh, we have been developing multi-scale uh, approaches to capture the spatial and also operational complexities of the grid. Our uh, scale, the scale in our methods starts from the uh, structure level, where we look at the uh, utility poles or uh, transmission towers and to the line, to a line that includes several of these structures to eventually to the distribution system and transmission system, which may include hundreds to thousands to even tens of thousands of critical nodes. With these modeling capabilities, we are able to uh, analyze the life cycle cost and resilience of the grid over long horizons. And uh, then we apply optimization techniques to uh, develop the capability to find the best course of action for hardening, for uh, maintaining the grid, as well as recently for integration of distributed generation units into the grid, all with the objective of improving the resilience of the system. For example, um, National Electric and Safety Code has set some guidelines for how to maintain the power grid infrastructure. We showed that using our methods, we are able to improve resilience by 30% over a uh, hundred year decision horizon and uh, with the same amount of resources that uh, would be needed based on NESC standard. And uh, this uh, amount of uh, improvement is significant uh, given that the studies have shown that even 1% or less improvement in resilience can save communities millions of dollars. At the end, I'd like to emphasize that uh, various impacts of uh, outages on the society may not be adequately and completely captured by looking only at economic loss, although it is an important factor. In the recent blackout in Texas, uh, millions of uh, people lost power for days, and the, the impact of these outages on communities uh, are significant, especially for vulnerable population. Also related to the theme of today's event about where you live matter, it was observed that uh, during Texas blackout, the more affluent parts of Texas, like downtowns, were 
nearly exempt from the rolling blackouts, while the neighboring communities, which were mostly lower-income communities, uh, some of them uh, were left without power for days. Uh, such possibilities we need to consider when we are making various decisions for the grid. Our objective in my lab is to improve our understanding uh, of complexity surrounding grid resilience and develop uh, strategies that can help uh, decision makers to improve resilience for all, not a particular uh, demographic. At the end, I'd like to thank uh, all my un undergraduate and graduate student researchers who helped the various stages of this research. And also I would like to thank the financial support from National Science Foundation, uh, AEP, and uh, CARI, as well as uh, the data support from Bonneville Power Authority, and of course, the Ohio State University. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Shikazna. Um, I do have a question. Can, can you talk a little bit about how I think one of the things you describe is how you model, you think about the, the incidence of various kinds of, um, of um, events on power grids. Can you, can you talk a little bit about the relationship between your work and what's going on with climate change? Yeah, so I, that's, uh, climate change is one of the major uh, drivers of change for the power grid. It impacts the power grid in, in several ways. It's, uh, first of all, it's changing uh, the demand on the system. Uh, when we have hotter days in, in summer, then the demand for power increases. And also with, with climate change, we have, uh, we have changes in the frequency and intensity of natural hazards, climatic hazards, and that, uh, increased uh, stress on the system is likely to create more failures in the system. It also, by climate change, we anticipate that the deterioration processes of the grid is going to be accelerated. And uh, these compounding effects uh, warrant uh, looking at this uh, driver very carefully. Where do you, where do you see um, as your future focus for your work? There are multiple fronts uh, that I'm excited about. One is, uh, is about the integration of the work we do with social sciences. Uh, in engineering, we are interested in quantifying things objectively, but some of the uh, problem we have is that it relates to the subjective human experience. And that's where engineers not, are not necessarily very qualified. And uh, through work with, through collaboration with social scientists, we can improve on that front. Also, I'm very excited about the, uh, integration of our methods with uh, artificial intelligence and uh, the capabilities of data analytics in, in resilience analysis and management. Look forward to seeing those things. Um, thank you so much. Um, we're going to uh, move on now to um, Dr. Kareem Usher. Um, Dr. Usher is going to be speaking about his research on urban food systems. And on um, that's what I have. <laughs> actually in its relationship to economic development and inequality. Uh, sorry, thank, thank you, uh, Rachel, and uh, good afternoon to everyone. Um, it's really uh, my pleasure to be able to stand up this project. It's, uh, we've been working at this for a few years and to be a conduit for uh, the voices that um, are not usually brought uh, to audiences such as this, right? So this work is certainly, uh, I believe, very impactful, but it also draws on um, Dr. Reese's and Dr. Danny Miller's work. So um, in terms of um, social determinants of health, we look at, you know, food access uh, is one of those social determinants along with um, gainful employment that pays a living wage for, uh, for community residents. And if we recall back to Dr. Reese's uh, maps that he had of uh, Columbus, um, areas that were predominantly African-American or people of color, and that can be overlaid with maps of opportunities and also access to food. And so this is where my work comes in, is sort of this um, intersection of these, the built environments, uh, food gaps are more collo colloquially known as food deserts, but we're also looking at people's lives and certainly those that are, that are more marginalized. And so to, to think about solutions here uh, is where we sort of 
jump off uh, from this with this work, um, uh, particularly in the neighborhood of Linden, which is just about southeast of our campus, of our Columbus campus here. And we can talk about all the negative statistics about Linden, but I, I certainly want to highlight that their most uh, uh, positive resource is the strength of people, the residents there that I've had the opportunity to work with and to see people, um, you know, establish businesses that are prospering in this area and to send their children to school and be able to uh, navigate the intricacies uh, and the difficulties, obstacles that they experience within in this neighborhood. Um, and so with that, you know, allowing a col collaboration of faith-based organizations and uh, that, that came to OSU to see, you know, you know, what is it that OSU, what resource that, that, that we have that we can, you know, lend itself to this issue in this neighborhood. And we were able to form a coalition of residents, um, faith-based organizations and other uh, NGOs. And we really put together this, what we call One Linden Cooperatives. And what we're uh, really hoping to do here is to uh, form a worker, uh, a worker owned business that would be profitable, that would um, engage in profit sharing and to, to create quality jobs around food um, and to be able to maintain and to keep um, wealth within the neighborhood. We've seen often in Columbus that even when uh, that other struggling neighborhoods are brought up, um, there's this element of gentrification and residents aren't able to stay. And uh, we want to be able to avoid that in Linden. Um, so co-ops are not new, right? We are not, this is not an experiment of something new that, we're, that we, uh, we just want to try in Linden. Um, co-ops have had success around the world and in this country for quite some time. Uh, so we know of Benjamin Franklin's work in, in putting together a, uh, a co-op to help uh, farmers in Philadelphia around fire insurance. We know during the civil rights era, um, uh, co-ops were formed to help black farmers and black workers. And even here in, in Ohio, in Youngstown, um, co-op was formed to help uh, the steel mill workers. It, it, it was not successful in that case, but we, all, but we do see other successful cases. Right, so this is something that has been tried and, and has been successful in, in many instances. And we're, we were able to take this idea and try to adopt it um, to this community in, in Linden. And so why co-ops and, and how, how, do, how differently do they operate? And we be believe that this gives uh, residents uh, a voice, uh, certainly a, a, to, to vote on, um, uh, the business is future, it's, uh, it's operations. Conflicts are, are resolved differently. It's not this so, sort of top-down management uh, to, to worker uh, relationship the in, this, in, this, uh, in this scenario. And there's also profit sharing or the profits may be turned back into the business, right? Again, to, to continue to generate, to be profitable and hopefully to expand. And here are some examples. And so um, certainly uh, we've been uh, working with one of our partners. Um, if you look in the top left, um, this is an example in Chicago. Uh, Shy Fresh, um, the person in the middle is the um, CEO of Upside Down Consulting with whom we're working. Um, and they were able to stand up this business. It's uh, uh, prepared meals. Um, uh, uh, business. And it's a co-op uh, owned by five previously incarcerated people. Um, generally, people who who have obstacles to get to, to gain full employment once they return to to, to the community. Um, we are also um, working with and you know consulting with um, others in Cincinnati, for example, um, around uh, energy there and. The work we're doing in Linden, we hope to actually modeling off of 
uh, evergreen cooperatives in Cleveland, we've had an opportunity to visit their laundry and to talk with their leadership there. And another example of co-ops is right here in uh, Columbus in Clintonville, and that's uh, Potty Cake Bakery. So once again, these examples are here in real time and uh, it really lends um, validity and credence to the work that we're doing. So where are we now? What, you know, how is this work going? As I mentioned, um, we've been pulling this together now for about three years or so. Uh, we've been able to gain um, a uh, procurement study from our, from our work with our, um, our, our, our one of our partners, the Democracy Collaborative. And with that procurement study, which is interviews of anchors such as Ohio State or uh, the Wexner Medical Center and the healthcare um, uh, organizations here in the Columbus area, um, we've been able to understand their needs and the needs of the clients that they serve. And we are uh, working with them in order to be able to at least provide some of that in a way that is local and sustainable and, and that we can create sort of a win-win relationship. So for example, uh, with the, uh, here on the Columbus campus, uh, speaking with dining services, they mentioned that uh, perhaps a tomato-based uh, product would be helpful, such as spaghetti sauce or salsa or something like that. If we're able to produce that, uh, to scale uh, in volume that would be able to, um, it would be able to be served in the dining halls here on campus that would again generate um, the type of, uh, to create a job and to generate a type of income that would be able to pay our, our worker owners uh, a living wage. And so what we've been doing as well is holding community listening sessions uh, throughout Linden. Uh, these are examples of two uh, listening sessions that we've had and we're moving into the phase of um, finalizing and seating our governance board. Um, and from there, we're going to uh, again move into establishing a nonprofit, developing our first business, uh, which would be food based. And, and then we have continue uh, sort of the community engagement and other uh, services needed for this project. But also we, we really need to stand this project up nationally and to, uh, to help to bring attention to it, to again, uh, bring these voices um, to the fore uh, that are not usually heard. I certainly wanna, couldn't do this without our many um, partners and our, on our team. I want to start with the fine young, the fine ladies on, on the left who are part of our uh, initial group and our um, uh, board and our executive team. Uh, certainly the College of Engineering and the Knowlton School that have certainly supported me and actually personally Rachel has been helpful uh, in, the, in this work. Um, and we've received uh, financial support through INFAC with Connect and Collaborate and and uh, the Ben Star Endowment Foundation. Uh, so uh, with that, I'll turn it over to Rachel. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Karine. I, I, I'm, what's so cool to, to this, for me to see this, is that um, we started with a germ of an idea and have worked very in a very dedicated way with the community along the way. And I think, can you talk a little bit about bridging from academia to the community and what, what, the, what's, what, what, are, the, what are the barriers and what are the good things? Uh, good, good question. Uh, certainly, why should I and my face be you know, working on this project? Um, and certainly we've known that Lyndon is not stranger to projects, right? They've been researched, um, certainly even through OSU. Um, and so there was some trust that needed to be developed and, and work to, to do. And, and so for me, that entailed me um, visiting people's homes and their businesses, their restaurants, um, sitting at their uh, dinner table at night and, um, and drinking tea and talking about, you know, uh, their, how long they've lived in this neighborhood and, 
uh, what they care about and what they would like to see. And so it, it's, it's really, you know, just being there and being with families and be able to understand what's, you know, what's the need, what the people Also need. Gaining, gaining confidence in each other as partners, yes. right? I think that's sure. something. I'd like to invite our other panelists back to the floor so that we can have some question and answer. We have some question and answer in the chat, and I think um, some of you have been going in and answering those questions. Thank you so much. And um, I do have, a, uh, there was one question that was submitted beforehand that I do want to ask. Um, before I get to that, I want to talk a little bit about the diversity of the people, the, the fields that we have on this call today and um, talk a little bit about the relationship among the engineering work that's doing, the modeling work that's going on here, and the planning work. Um, can you talk a little bit about how that plays out in our, in our college and in the university? What are those relationships? How do we strengthen them? I'm happy to talk a little bit about, about that. So I think one of the strengths that I had mentioned of OSU is the diverse group of people. Um, and there's diversity in, in so many ways, um, which is fantastic because working with different types of people makes us, makes us all stronger. And diversity among fields, I think is really important to, to address a lot of these really challenging questions. They're multifactorial. There is a, a technical science component that needs to address that needs to be addressed. There's really complex social components. There's like a whole spectrum of issues that need to be addressed to really tackle any of these problems. And a single field can't do it alone. Um, you really have to work with a great team um, and everybody needs to bring their A game to addressing all of these challenges. You need, you need the best social scientists, you need the best technical scientists, you need for, for whatever problem it is. And so I think it's so important to have these different people working together. Um, I know I've personally learned so much from my collaborations with social scientists as well as the great people at Nationwide Children's Hospital in terms of learning about the issues that they're addressing. Um, and you know, you could, be, you could be working on the bench as a scientist and come up with an amazing discovery, but if it doesn't solve a problem, really what, what good is that? You know, maybe it will solve a future problem and sometimes, sometimes that will come to light later, but it's really important to know that what you're working on is going to help someone. I think that's something that unites the, the fields that we have in the college, right? That that's the goal. Um, so there was a question that was submitted, um, which is along the lines of how do we undo things or how do we change things? And so this one is the effects of historic discriminatory urban practices, let's say urban design practices, such as redlining neighborhoods and racially restrictive zoning are by no means relegated to the past. In order to build a more equitable communities, how can planners better understand and acknowledge this legacy of discrimination and actively work to undo its persisting effects. I know this is a topic that is near and dear to the hearts of the faculty here. So Jason, go ahead. Yeah, um, I, I think the first part of that, and this is a part of my uh, work that I didn't talk about today is, um, you know, bringing that history uh, to the forefront um, and recognizing that, um, that we haven't done a good job uh, traditionally in communicating um, just how severe many of these levers of discrimination in the built environment have been. Um, and, uh, and thinking about how, you know, as a process of, uh, um, I, I consider really as a process of healing, um, how do we engage around this history to um, document, acknowledge what happened um, and position ourselves to better understand how contemporary versions of these barriers manifest today? Um, and what do we do about it? Um, so, you know, you can draw a direct connection to, um, you know, housing discrimination used to be done by racial zoning, then it was done by racially restrictive covenants. Um, now it's done through exclusionary zoning practices, right, that are race neutral on their face, um, but have um, a powerful effect. And so I think drawing the relationships and connections from the past to the present is really critical. And I think that's a space where um, as scholars, we can uh, you know, provide a, a voice um, and provide the um, historical analysis that's really needed uh, in that discussion. 
And, and I do think the kind of effort that um, Kareem's involved in is kind of the flip side of that, is uh, returning the ability to gain wealth through business ownership, basically. Right? I mean, you're addressing a, yeah. a local problem with local resources, basically. It, it, Exactly. And I, I just want to go back a little bit in terms of, you know, how this can be addressed and certainly through institutions such as the Ohio State University um, in terms of um, hiring and, uh, and, and supporting faculty of, co of color and faculties that have um, uh, different, different trajectory to this part and have different stories and able to, to then, you know, bring that and lift up. Um, you know, others that are, that are seldom in these spaces. So I think that's, that's an important recognition oh. and also moving forward. Thanks. There, there, is, um, there are some other questions that are, that are a little bit specific, but I think, um, I don't, well, so th th there's a, a question about, um, let's, let, me, let me ask this question up to um, Abdullah. Will distributed generation, home solar panels, et cetera, widen the inequities as rich suburban neighborhoods can generate their own power while urban or poor neighborhoods cannot? Yeah, that's, a, that's a great question um, that indicates uh, innovation should be combined with right policies. Uh, of course, there's, there's a significant benefits to um, distributed generation. First, uh, it, uh, it uh, helps with decarbonization of the grid and reducing the impact on on climate change, and also it improves resilience and uh, also reduces the cost. But uh, as was noted in the comment, uh, these are currently affordable mostly by uh, higher income communities. And even when it is subsidized by the government, even the subsidized version of it is not affordable for lower income communities. So uh, basically then that policy leads to increasing the gap in terms of the uh, services of the grid. Also, but there is another level of impact too that uh, while the distribution generation reduces the utility sales, but it doesn't reduce the utility fixed cost, mean, meaning that the, the cost of maintaining the grid. And as those communities that are relying on distributed generation are reducing their reliance on the grid and therefore they pay less to, the, to maintaining the grid, the cost of maintaining the grid is going to be uh, uh, going to lower income communities and their uh, their bills will likely increase if right policies are not implemented. I'm just trying to figure out what we do about that. But I think that's a, that's there's a parallel question about um, funding of education in school districts, which I think is not so different than that distributed uh, energy, uh, which is really. Um, could you comment on the negative impact of funding school districts through property taxation on K-12 equity education? Yeah, um, this directly relates into the context of, of Move to Prosper, um, as well as some of the other projects that I referenced. Uh, um, you know, when I think about uh, challenges that um, particularly many urban schools, but also some rural schools face, uh, it's really that nexus of um, being under-resourced um, and the, the property tax, the, the um, reliance on the property tax is a big part of that. And in addition to um, being in situations where they have higher, uh, a higher degree of need in the context of the school district, um, older facilities, um, kids that are more uh, transportation dependent in terms of needing to be mm -hmm. bused, um, as well as uh, needing more resources. And so um, I do believe, you know, structurally, uh, a funding solution uh, in terms of our K-12 system is a big macro level change that could um, you know, really kind of change the entire layout of the chessboard in terms of uh, how people have access uh, to high performing uh, educational resources. And it, it does seem from the chat, there's a, there are the questions, there are a number of questions that were put up here about um, the idea of scaling a relocation program. And, these questions of in in so what do we, I mean, there's a bigger problem of, um, of unequal access to re access to opportunities, resources, uh, jobs, whatever those things might be. Um, but also in some time, I mean, I think uh, Kareem's work shows that there's a lot of, a lot of um, strength also in communities, right? 
And I think that, so can you talk um, about this question of uh, relocation, scaling up relocation versus community development and that whole, that, that, that's a question that, ever, that always comes up when we have these kinds of Yeah, and I wanted to acknowledge that comment. Yes, scaling up is a critical kind of challenge in the context. And, and in some ways, you know, there is, there is a, a limitation to how much you really wanna scale housing mobility programs from that perspective. Um, I, I think what's center for me is, is what, um, where's the agency of folks who are living in these neighborhoods and in these housing units? And how do we develop policy that creates options that um, you know, can, those folks can kind of act upon their preferences and what they want to do? Um, I've worked in neighborhood contexts similar to Kareem, where um, there are tremendous assets in that neighborhood and, and the resiliency of folks in that neighborhood are tied to those, their connection to those assets and their social resources. Um, I've also worked um, and moved to Prosper as a great example of this. I've worked with families that are terrified for this health and safety of their children. They don't have the time to wait 10 years for a neighborhood to improve. Um, they're terrified that their kid's gonna get hurt uh, coming home from school any day of the week. And um, you know, I think both of those residents sh uh, should have their preferences supported by our policies. Um, and uh, you know, recognizing too that you know, one solution doesn't fit for everyone and we need a more multifaceted policy uh, framework. Um, and the last comment I'd make there too is a structurally the big shift that, that can happen in addition to K-12 funding is um, reducing these self-inflicted barriers uh, to housing access such as exclusionary zoning. This is a self-inflicted wound that we can reform through policy. Um, and so that is a, a larger kind of goal outside of just smaller scale housing mobility programs. So the, um, the other question, I'm, I'm sorry, Karim, did you want to address that? Um, yeah, yes, uh, Jason, of, of course, is certainly the expert here on, on this one, and, uh, and I, I like your response there, Jason, and uh, I, I think sometimes, however, from a planning perspective, um, it's just how, um, I guess what I'm promoting is a little bit more compassion, and as uh, Dr. Safez mentioned, about the subjectivity, um, lacking in maybe the objective fields. Yeah. Um, planners are somehow sometimes caught in between what we want to be and we have this, we vacillate between and, and, and lack some sort of identity of who we are. Sometimes it comes out as that, but um, a bit more of this um, leaning into emotion or the subjective or the emotive and, and, and how we can manifest that in a, in a methodology of planning. There's a couple more questions. Uh, one of them has to do with um, you, you all presented research that is applied in many ways, right? And you and you are active in translating it to um, policy to um, uses in the field. And so uh, the question here is, what resources exist to translate these findings into policies at the local and state level? I don't know how, how you think about that for your own work. Um, I can talk about two different resources here at OSU, and I'm curious what others have to say as well. Uh, one is for um, different devices, such as the sensors we're working on. There are a lot of commercialization resources where we can bring uh, basic research into practice. Um, one ex example is the REACH program um, here at Ohio State, which uh, REACH for commercialization, and there are a lot of other programs and, and resources on campus to assist with that. Um, in terms of uh, translation into policy, there is the Office of uh, Government Affairs at Ohio State, which can help. Um, I've been contacted by um, people interested in creating policy to address some of these issues, and they've been ext extremely helpful. Um, you know, that's that the policy side is outside of what I usually do, and they've been really helpful um, in terms of helping me uh, talk with those individuals about um, next steps. Other thoughts from um, the panels? Um, also through, uh, again, uh, huge institutions such as the Wexner. So I also serve on the health equity um, committee through Wexner. And uh, it's, it's a coalition, again, of, uh, across fields, but being able to uh, provide sort of a, a, a a society-wide policy, I think, uh, organizations or, or, or coalitions such as that are very helpful. Yeah, and Move to Prosper is also that kind of coalition across 
uh, different parts of the university and of parts across different parts of the community um, to come together to create something that didn't exist before. Um, I wanna thank you all for sharing your research with us this afternoon. Um, I've learned a lot from you and I, I know that we will have other opportunities to speak about it. I'm gonna hand the floor back to Laura to close us, to finish this off. One, and let me add my thanks on behalf of the rest of the audience to you, to Rachel, to Kareem, Jason, Abdullah, Karen. We really appreciate your insight today and, and we appreciate learning more about what you're doing and hopefully um, how we as a college can train the next generation of engineers and planners to take up this good work. So um, thank you for that. I also wanna say a special thank you to those behind the scenes who helped us put this event together. That would be our leadership from city and regional planning and civil engineering, Jennifer Clark and Allison McKay, along with Courtney Ross and Diane Lozier. Thank you so much for leading us to these great faculty doing amazing things in the community. If you want to learn a little bit more about anything you've heard about today, please feel free to reach out to me directly. My contact information should be appearing on the screen any moment now. I'd be happy to connect you with our speakers or with any other area of the college that you might be interested in. And if you would like to help us by taking the next step and helping the college and our commitment to equity, we do have a few different options for you. So I'm going to go ahead and launch a poll here. If you are interested in contributing to our diversity, outreach and inclusion priority fund, go ahead and respond to this poll and a member of our team will reach out to you to um, make contact about that. And just so you know, all gifts to this fund amplify a $100,000 dollar seed investment that the college has made to help pursue these diversity efforts that we've been talking about. I also, you know, maybe you're one of those folks that's more comfortable texting. You can text the word engineering to 91999 and you'll receive a link to donate to this fund. I would encourage you, if you are wanting to learn more about what we as a college are doing, you can read our Racial Equity and Inclusion Action Plan. The link to that should be on your screen, and we will be sending it to you in an email post-event. So take a look at that, and if there's any um, part of that plan that you feel connected to or you would like to support with your time, your talent, or your treasure, please reach out to me. I'd love to hear from you about that. We will be sending you a post event email with a survey. I know we all get these surveys, but I would encourage you to um, take this survey because we're starting to look ahead to the future of what our engagement activities will look like. So we're looking for your opinions on whether you'd be comfortable coming back to in person events when the safety protocols allow us to do so, whether you are interested in continuing virtual events, things like that. We really need your input to plan for how we can continue to engage with you going forward. And last but definitely not least, if you are not already following the college on our social media, I definitely encourage you to do that. This is where you're going to hear stories like what you've heard today about our faculty researchers, our staff, our students doing amazing work. Um, you'll be able to link with fellow engineers, planners, and architects on our LinkedIn page. So take advantage of those resources when you can. And again, on behalf of the entire college, thank you for joining us today. Have a great afternoon.